What's going on guys? Welcome back. And I am here to talk some more His Dark Materials because here in Canada, this season has drawn to a close. And I was going to wait until the new year to make this video, but yet again, I just have too many thoughts about this show floating around in my head that I want to get out there. So, this will be my spoiler-filled discussion for the entirety of His Dark Material Season 3, or more specifically, the second half, since I have already made a video covering the first half of this season, which you can click on right here. But without further ado, let's get into it. I guess, picking up from where we left off, I really appreciated that they condensed a lot of the storyline with Mary Malone and the Mulifas, because in my opinion at least, everything surrounding the Mulifa world in the book was pretty dragged out and kind of boring. It's nowhere near as interesting as what's going on with Lyra and Will or Mrs. Coulter and Azriel's Rebellion. So, I think condensing most of that story into a montage at the beginning of the fifth episode was a smart choice. They gave you just enough time with Mary and the Mulifas for you to feel an emotional connection with them, but they didn't overstay their welcome like they did in the book. And as I said in my previous video, at the midpoint of this season, both Lyra and Marissa were faced with an ultimatum. They could no longer worm their way out of their situations. Which is why I found it quite fascinating that in the fifth and sixth episodes, their characters had to appeal to emotion rather than just lie or trick their way out of their respective situations. Once Marissa is about to be executed by Father McPhail, the last possible thing she can do is plea to her former colleague, Dr. Cooper, who ends up stopping the blade moments before it cuts Marissa from her demon. Likewise, in the Land of the Dead, Lyra can't lie to the Harpies. They can literally see right through you to tell if you're lying or not, so the only way to get through to them is to tell them stories. Truthful and honest stories. I suppose there is an argument to be made that Lyra's presumed death in the sixth episode is a cheap storytelling device. But I think it's actually quite effective. I'll compare this to my favorite film of all time, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. There's a scene in that film where the mouth of Sauron lies to Aragorn and the rest of the Fellowship by telling them that Frodo is dead. We as the audience of course know that Frodo is still alive, but to them, this is a crushing defeat. Them believing that he's dead isn't what makes that scene powerful, though. What makes that scene powerful is that despite them believing that they've lost, they go on fighting nonetheless. In this show, once Lyra is presumed to have been killed by the Magisterium's targeted bomb, Marissa is forced to look deep within herself and confront her demons, both literally and figuratively. We are treated to a fantastic scene between Mrs. Coulter and Serafina Pecola, where she begs Serafina to kill her because she can't bear the pain of losing Lyra. At first, she lies and says that she didn't love Lyra, despite the fact that we know that obviously isn't the case, but then she goes on to admit that she was incapable of loving Lyra properly because of how warped she is as a person. Now, I know people are going to say that the ending of this season was the most emotional part of it. And don't get me wrong, it was extremely emotional. But strangely enough, the scene that actually hit me the hardest was when Marissa finally sits down with her demon and apologizes in a way, forgiving herself. Which isn't necessarily a good thing. When you've done as many messed up things as Marissa has, you should definitely be apologizing to those you've wronged before apologizing to yourself. But in this story where this character has become so disconnected from herself, it's actually quite beautiful. 
Marissa's entire character arc was handled perfectly. She is by all accounts a terrible person. Even Serafina Pekala herself states that she's a monster. But love changed her for the better, and she ultimately gives up everything to save her daughter. The same goes for Lord Asriel, who is quite literally forced to grapple with himself and put aside his own ego to ensure Lyra's safety. Even less significant characters like Dr. Cooper, a person who willingly murdered and tortured children, finally does the right thing moments before her death. These aren't your typical redemption arcs, because this isn't a story like Star Wars, where one good act wipes out all the bad that someone has done, but there is something comforting about knowing that these people did the right thing, even if it was moments before their deaths. But even if we make mistakes and terrible things, we can try to make things right, and that's what matters, trying. Lyra says in the final episode that she'll never be able to forgive her parents for what they did, but she doesn't hate them either. And that's something that all of us should strive to do. Carrying resentment in your heart can be damaging, and her saying that shows a great deal of maturity on her part. Not only was it very poignant to see several of these characters finally step up and do the right thing, but it was also satisfying to see the characters who stayed steadfast in their evil and immoral beliefs get some comeuppance for their actions. Hugh MacPhail is killed by the very authority he claims to serve. Metatron sends down a beam of angelic light which activates the bomb and severs MacPhail from his demon. Likewise, Father Gomez is killed by an angel, a representation of the authority he also claims to serve. Gomez tells Balthamos that they're on the same side. But Balthamos recognizes that under any circumstances, the murder of an innocent child is wrong. Something else I appreciated about this season were the moments of closure it provided for several of the characters. For example, Lyra getting a final moment with the golden monkey as they reach out to each other just as the monkey disintegrates into the air. I know some people didn't like that because in the book, she never finds out about what happened to her parents. And I don't think this ruins that, because Lyra still doesn't know how her mother and father died, but she does know that they're gone. And that does give her character some level of closure, which I thought was a good narrative decision. Likewise, Will returning to his world at the end and reuniting with his mother, that was a moment which I felt was sorely lacking from the book. As well as Will reuniting with his father in the Land of the Dead, Joppery admitting that he was wrong about Will's nature of being a warrior. I really like the added detail at the beginning of the end credits where it says that Will ended up becoming a surgeon later in life, because as he says, he hates fighting, so I find it very befitting of his character to have chosen a career that involves saving people from dying. I even liked that Commander Ogunwi got a nice reunion with his daughters, showing that his one daughter whose soul had been cut away from her, similar to the demons being cut from the children in Bolvanger, had her soul restored to her in a way, and they can go on being a happy family. This season never prioritized spectacle over the characters and story. Sure, we have moments like Lord Asriel flying around shooting angels in the intention craft, or Mrs. Coulter blowing up the specters, but even those moments serve a character purpose. Mrs. Coulter destroying the specters shows us how her character has changed, an ability that she originally used for a malicious purpose, tracking down and kidnapping her daughter, she is now using to protect others. If you think about it, the big battle isn't even the climax of the story. It happens in the penultimate episode. The real climax is Lyra and Will falling in love, which is something 
I've always found interesting about this story. It isn't about the big battles between bears, witches, and angels. It's about something as simple as love. Mary Malone asks the angels of Fania if her role in this story really was as simple as encouraging two young people to discover their love for each other, and it was. The ending of the season is suitably bittersweet, with Will and Lyra forced to remain in their respective worlds and never see each other again. Lyra says that it's unfair for them to have to give up what they found after everything they've been through, which is true. But life isn't fair, and I think all of us can connect with that in some way, including myself. I don't like to get super in-depth about my personal life on this channel, but I feel like it's relevant in this case. Very recently, I left behind a bond with someone which had defined who I was for quite a while. Keep in mind, this was not a romantic connection like the one presented in this story. And Lyra and Will went their separate ways due to circumstance rather than a conscious choice like in my case. However, it can still be quite painful. But Mary Malone says that it's better to live for love than die for it. And although that is what Marissa and Asriel end up doing, we still need to move on. Serafina Pecola tells Lyra that she'll never lose what she has with Will and that they've shaped each other forever, which is true of life, and I feel like that's just a different way of saying that it's better for us to value what was rather than focus on what we no longer have. Moving on to some more superficial elements, there were some small changes from the source material, particularly in the final episode, that I felt were beneficial to the story. For example, in the book there's a weird scene where Mary Malone sees Father Gomez enter their tree from a distance. The next day she tells Lyra and Will about this, but proceeds to let them wander freely with a rifleman on the loose who could be a threat to their safety. Thank God they didn't include that scene in the show, because I think it's extremely damaging to her character. I also liked that the confrontation between Father Gomez and Balthamos was a more subtle or quiet scene rather than the action-y scene that it was in the book. I just find that scene kind of jarring in the book, where they're intercutting between Lyra and Will's confession of love with this chase scene between Father Gomez and Balthamos. I'm glad they changed that for the series because the pacing of the episode flowed much better. With that being said, there were still some creative decisions which pulled me out of the series a tiny bit. For example, in the final episode, after Lyra gives her speech to Will about how once they travel through the land of the dead and their atoms become one with the universe someday, they'll finally be together again, it hard cuts to a shot of the Mulafas rolling around on their seed pods, and I couldn't help but crack up because the tonal whiplash was insane. I also found it kind of amusing when Mrs. Coulter confronts Metatron in the Kingdom of Heaven, and he just walks out wearing this stylish leather jacket. There was something very amusing about that. And I understand that some people are very frustrated about the major changes from the source material. In particular, the Galavespians are almost completely absent from the show, despite them being pretty significant characters in the book. But just think about Peter Jackson's decision to exclude Tom Bombadil from The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. He was an important character to the story of the book, but he wasn't as important to the story being told in the films. And the Lord of the Rings films are still some of the best book-to-screen adaptations of all time. An adaptation doesn't mean having to include everything from the book. I think the creatives on this show felt similarly about the Galavespians the way that Peter Jackson did about Tom Bombadil. They may have been important to the story of the book, but they weren't important to the story they were telling in this adaptation. 
I think their decision to exclude them is logical, because it gives them more time to focus on Lyra and Will's relationship, which is at the heart of the story. Overall, I think this season was phenomenal. It does change things from the source material, but most of those changes are beneficial to the story and characters, and it sticks true to the heart of that original story. Is this the best season of the show? Quite possibly. I don't want to sound hyperbolic because I may just be riding the high from that finale, but there's so much care, love, and effort put into this series. It doesn't just feel like a studio-mandated corporate product like most of the shows this year have, but you guys let me know. What are your thoughts on His Dark Materials Season 3 and the series overall? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Just whatever your thoughts are. Please let me know them all in the comments below. And of course, as always, I hope you guys have a great day. Take care.